This is what we call. Get the foil on the side. Yeah, fiber plate fits on You see, it's watery. The apple breaks down in four ways. It be, either becomes moldy or powdery, but this is not moldy or powdery. <coughs> it still has liquid in it. So, this is another way it breaks down into what we call the watery condition. There's another way it breaks, it gets hard, shriveled up like a prune. No water, it doesn't powderize. And there's a fourth way, it stays natural, firm, no molding or breaking down for at least two years. In this case, this is what we call the watery frequency. And the principle for that is to dissolve. So when you're going to treat or work on somebody, you have to plant it. Now? Uh, I mean, I mean, you to get today, it tomorrow? Right tomorrow yeah. The particular code in setting up in your brain to the frequency that you're locked into, and that applies only to you at the initiation, how you're locked in to the frequencies of the atoms, you're locked into the what is called the dissolving function of it. So if you are going to work on somebody and they ask you first, then you visualize by saying, you want to write it down or you have it written, uh, printed out, you want to give them a copy of it? Mm -hmm. So this will give her an <coughs> idea of which frequency she's working with. Now, a frequency isn't better than another one. It's just like you're assigned by the FCC. <laughs> <laughs> Take the uh, way you like to work with. You can own 15 different uh, stations and have different wavelengths, but each one is a specified action. So dissolving goes like this, divine will flowing through me will dissolve all those conditions that interfere with the normal and harmonious flow of this individual, and they call their name, so Joan or Jane or Jim. It has been said, it is done, so be it. We thank you for manifesting this now. That's the process of how you release the energy, and you know and you identify with the frequency. And as an initiate, you are given the power to crystallize the atom with your mouth. So you should be already uh, reach one year of application control with the frequency to which you are locked into that by the, that time to now, your consciousness is synchronizing with your words and with the atomic frequencies. The only person who has forgiveness and extension of the compassionate nature is a passenger. That's a non-initiate. The initiate is a driver. They are called upon to make account for every action <coughs> they do with their mouth. And so if you don't realize what you are <coughs> in terms of the initiation, you will have to, uh, you're initiated because all that you said in a just or unjust state have to materialize from the atomic level because you're behind the wheel now. 
you're not a passenger no more. Passengers are allowed, that is, the non-initiate are allowed to make mistakes, be forgiven, be com uh, compassionately released by those who are evolved, but those who are already behind the wheel, that is, the initiate is a person who assumes the responsibility of the spoken word with the atom and the identification of the atom in order to become Christ realized or God realized, that person doesn't have a passenger quality no more. That person is a driver. The policeman is not going to give the passenger the ticket. He's going to give the driver the ticket. So from that standpoint, you assume responsibility for the spoken word as an initiate. But to see which level or frequency that this particular process is set up in your particular case, the apple is a measuring device. We can't imagine it, and we can't assign it to a person at initiation. We have to be able to validate it, that when you put your love into it, you put your integrity of consciousness to flow. And therefore, it will manifest what you are set up to work with. There are two types of beings. Those who would like to tap in on you as a non-initiate and use you as a telephone boot. And there are those who are forced to materialize, to convince you that they do exist. So you as an initiate doesn't take chances or guess at your integrity of conscious communication because you're given a technique to check out if you're a victim of imagination or you're actually going to make contact with a being who is fully realized. A fully realized being cannot use a telephone boot. For example, Saul went to someone who was a telephone boot and his teacher really laid it into him. Samuel told him, why you call me this way? I'm not that type of an individual. And he exposed him because Saul went in disguise to the person <coughs> who they call the witch of Endor, and a witch is only a person's label, but she was a channel to make contact with beings in another dimension. But when she found out who the customer was, and that he was the actual king of the country in disguise, she really laid into him too. But she was also made vulnerable by the fact that the person she was calling up was a realized being, and he really chastised both of them. Now, that went through time as a way without any resolve. When Jesus came, he had to resolve it. He couldn't leave it like that. So he took his disciples, who were initiates, into a garden, and he made them confront <coughs> two beings who were forced to do what? Materialize themselves so that they could be seen. And those who saw it, were the ones who were conscious while they were waiting. Those who didn't see it were the ones that were sleeping. So we tell you, as of the moment you're initiated and you're in the process of practicing your meditation, you are working to a non-sleep state. The non-sleep state allows you to function within the visible range of the actualization of the being who is fully realized. A non-initiate may not get there until he's initiated and he's not allowed to interact with it because the beings who show themselves aren't interested in a non-initiate unless it's an emergency for health. Then they will materialize and give some kind of a compensation. And in that state, when they do it, you, the sick person, have no way to impose or fool them. So they can't be made vulnerable by your illness. You're honest for the first time when you're sick. And you're crying out for help when you're sick. And you're forced to accept the actual manifestation as a sick person. So there's no room for a healthy person to call a being from a higher level to appear to give them a visible proof unless a teacher is working with a student at the initiate level then the integrity of the student is brought into focus for those beings. Now, 
the integrity of the being not wanting to be seen and wanting to use the mechanism as a means to communicate. That's an entire option. They are not going to go through birth and they're not going to assume responsibility for your mistakes, but they will be glad to come through to talk to those who want to listen and give information, but they'll never take a visible manifestation because they are not in that level. So we are not condemning them. We are trying to show the journey of the initiate is not the journey of the non-initiate. And the journey of the initiate requires cleaning up your body. So when Jesus came, he gave his disciples tangible evidence of visualization. And later on, when he actually went through the crucifixion, which is the death experience, and then the disciples were torn up now between as initiates, where do they go from there? Is it that their teacher has left them in a stranded level of consciousness or not? Then he came back to them and gave them the visualization by coming through the wall and calling upon Thomas the scientist. We call him Doubting Thomas or nitty gritty headed, mud headed type, <laughs> like a Dano, who don't believe nothing till he sees it. So he says, Okay, boy, check me out. This is flesh and blood. It's not a no ghost in your head now, and no imagination. And if you're satisfied, good. I'll eat a little piece of fish and bread with you. And leave it to you, say, don't rot. And bye bye, and he took off through the wall. So, this is evidence of actualization. That is, the person is in full control of the atom by the spoken word. So, then the 11 disciples that <coughs> could go out, knowing their initiates, and live their word and see it materialize for them. And they only have one mission in life is to help others to find what they are. They don't have any other mission. So by giving them that, he gave them certain ways to identify how they can lock into the energy. You as an initiate now, you have the, the measurement of the way the apple breaks down to indicate what frequency you're locked into. In your case, you are the dissolver. Another person might be a rebuilder, which is a large one that doesn't break down for two years, or another person may be an eliminator, a powdery object, or it may be a strengthener. But each person isn't better than the other. They're just at their frequencies of how they work with the energy, is where they line up. Eventually, all four frequencies dovetail into one as you emerge into your higher consciousness but you have to work through step by step to see it. So it's not a belief system. It is a knowing of what you are and what you're doing. Now, the evidence is in your capability to function in a practical manner and not be impractical. And this is what would radiate or be obvious in the person, how they cope daily, moment to moment, in everyday living. So, what you do now with the apple, now that you recognize your frequency that you're set up with the atom, plant the apple in a pot indoors till it sprouts up and comes like a, a little tree, you know, then you can transfer it to the ground. You can't plant it directly. Right. Not right into the ground right away, no, because you want evidence that it is taking root. Mm -hmm. You see, the seeds don't die, they're there in that uh, state, and they're in a certain particular <coughs> frequency now. <coughs> now. There's a reason why you plant it. Can we have a reason? <laughs> well, this borders on your fairy tale uh, fiction as a child but it's also borders on the actual reality of the future. <laughs> As years go by, 
and as we become more technically advanced, <coughs> we will hurt each other very unmercedes with equipment where there would be no means of reverting the illness or the damage done by medical profession. It will take a type of therapy that involves a highly atomically aligned individual to resolve it. So the product of that therapy is locked up in this process. And to give you a fairy tale, if looking for the golden apple that heals the deafness of the dead. <clears throat> you hear what kind of disease that is? It's a fairy tale. Looking for the golden apple that heals the deafness of the dead. Would be rebirth. Hmm? Would that be rebirth? Well, the dead is dead, right? Right. Mm -hmm. they, they can't hear you. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, so if you can heal the deafness of the dead by a certain uh, substance, and you have life. Then they, you come back to life. It's a resurrection. Now, we aren't supposed to go around doing uh, what Jesus do all the time, raising the dead from the grave, you know, like Lazarus. <clears throat> but we're going to have a lot of people hurt by uh, technical weaponry that don't deserve to be phased on that easily. And we will call to be compassionate. So the product of these apple trees will be for a certain type of illnesses to resolve and rebuild families that will be destroyed by the loss of their loved ones. Right now? Yeah. Um, my apple tree got eaten by elk or deer. <laughs> He's a lucky deer. <laughs> lucky deer. <laughs> I'm wondering if, if I can get a second chance. <laughs> <laughs> I planted it out in the yard instead of planting it in a pot. <laughs> well, let's see if you're approved. <laughs> I'll be coming through. Between here are Flagstaff, which area I'm in. Maybe they were going to get shot by the little bit. So we'll see if you're approved. Okay. Now, you're approved. You can. Now, there are going to be different type of illnesses that are not going to be resolved by medical profession. It's going to be out of the range of the medical profession. It involves a lot of atomic knowledge. And this is a shortcut that we are trying to... We know that Mr. Nostradamus was not a liar. What he's saying is valid, but we don't have to be a victim of his predictions. That's the difference between knowing what is there waiting versus being the victim of what is waiting or being capable of coping with it and being prepared to cope with it when it occurs. So a lot of us are going to be forced to face atomic radiation in work or locations that we don't expect to be when these things occur. And we don't have to be a victim, especially the initiate or the initiate relatives. So this is why we're trying to build up certain preventative measures or curative measures for those conditions when they come. It's like what we say, planting the seed now to reap the reward of when that particular condition comes, so we know what to do. When everything else fails, find the apple. So, well, how do you, I'll give you a little story. There was a war at the time of Rama, who was the husband of Sita, and the war was taking place in a country called Lanka, today known as Ceylon. And it's the old name has come back to it, Lanka. And the king of Lanka, his name was Ravana. He had kidnapped Sita. Well, the brother, uh, Rama, and his brother Lakshman recruited several armies to go and fight to regain his wife. But they were constantly beaten by Ravana who was a very highly evolved mystic and could read every movement and block it. And Lakshman got hurt, that's the brother of Rama, and in the hurt, 
Rama called upon his uh, priest therapist to find out what would be the best means to heal the brother. And they told Rama that he needed the fruit from the tree of life to heal the brother. Now, where could he find this fruit from the tree of life? There are only two tree of life, the human body, and one externally in some location in the Himalayas. So when Rama called and he says, where could he find it? <coughs> they said, the fruit of life, or the tree of life, is on a mountain called Parbat. And it's in the Himalayas. But how would he find it? How would he recognize it? And the priest told them, and they go to this tree, uh, mountain, on this tree where this fruit is growing, there will be a light. It will flash to those who have the eyes to see. No, so no ordinary person can go find it. That means that an initiated or highly evolved person would have to spot the tree. So Hanuman was the person who volunteered to go and look for the tree. Hanuman took off and while he was going towards Parbat, Ravana, who was meditating, could see the whole thing taking place. So it, with his power, he caused every tree on the Mount uh, Parbat to have a light. <coughs> that would confuse now Ravana when he, uh, or confuse uh, Hanuman when he got there. So when Hanuman got there, he was kind of puzzled. Every tree got a light. He said, what the heck? <laughs> it just can't be possible. Something is wrong. And then he called down on God for guidance. And he had the command to move the mountain. So in his consciousness, he gave the command to the mountain to move. The mountain began to move. This is the reference when Jesus came years after to that particular incident when he said, if you have faith in me like a grain of mustard seed, you say unto the mountain, move and it'll move. Actually, Parbat did move, and Parbat does exist. Hanuman took Parbat with all the lighted trees right back to Lanka, and on his way crossing over from Parbat to Lanka, he had to go over exactly the area where Rama lived. Now, Rama's country was called Ayodhya, which we call India today. That portion of India was occupied by his half-brother, Bharat, and the half-brother heard this rumbling in the sky through his own particular knowledge and called in his men to find out what's going on. And they said that the men fired a weapon into the sky. Now the weapon's name was Agenban, literally mean heat-seeking device. Now you tell me, you translate from the Vedas a, a word like that, again a heat-seeking device or fire, what kind of machine is that? Is it not an arrow? <laughs> oh, heat-seeking device is a missile <laughs> in today's language. <laughs> but this heat-seeking device found the, and hit Hanuman in the knee and brought him down. And when he came down, he was vulnerable to Bharat. But then he told Bharat that he was on his way to carry this apple or from the tree of life to save the brother of Rama, Lakshman, who is injured. And when he realized that they were half brothers, he then gave a prayer over Hanuman and wished him to get on board a vehicle which they call a Vamana. It travels by sound. Now this is a tr sound traveling device that will take him to where he wanted to go by the focusing of the voice. Well, today we know that <clears throat> does exist because UFO equipment has been shown to operate by sonic resonance on radar screens that defy everything in radio. So here he gives the command on the Vamana, and that's the actual term that's being used today by those who have any experience with the extraterrestrials, the vehicles called a Vamana. It beams in, and he lands on Lanka, known as Ceylon. And then the priest reaches for the right 
tree with the one that has the right object and here's the brother Lakshman. But then the question comes up, where do you put the residue? That's the cause of all the wars, you know. You can do all kind of magic, materialize everything with your mind and your mouth, but what do you do with the residue? So take for one moment, you can say, I need an apple, and there, materializes the apple in your hand. No work done to make the apple right. You didn't plant it. You didn't have to wait long enough. You just spoke the word and you have a big, nice apple. What color you like? Yellow, red, orange, nice big one. And then you eat it. And you're satisfied. But then you have residue. Where do you do the residue? You can't throw it in my space because I'll throw it back at you. And I don't think anyone in this room will allow you to put your residue in their space. Because everyone in this room has the ability to do what materialize apples. You see what the problem is now? <laughs> think of that why, why we got the cosmic wars. And to this day, the cosmic wars are locked into the residue. And even our local atomic wars is a residue. Chernobyl and all these things are all the residues. We call it ecological uh, danger, right? So that's where we come back to. Where do they put Parbat, this mountain with all these trees that are false versus the real one? They said Hanuman took off and went to a place and then put it on top of another mountain as a resting place. And the name of that place was called Everest. Now you go to India, right, the borderland of Tibet, <coughs> and you'll find the highest mountain in the world, and it's called Mount Everest. And people have climbed it, and everyone who's climbed to the top of Mount Everest come back and tell you it's a double mountain. It's not one single mountain like the rest of the mountains. It's a peak hill placed on top of a mountain, but in such a way it's set you can hardly define where it begins and ends, but the vegetation on the top is not the same vegetation as below, where it divides. <coughs> when uh, Hillary went up, he proved that, that the bottom portion of this plateau section that extends out like, it goes like this. The one bottom part is wider, and there's vegetation there, and then the upper section goes out like a ledge, and then builds up like a peak point. But the vegetation at the top is not the same as the one below. And they can't explain that in no way to themselves because the way the formation and the rocks are different on the same mountain. So that's where <coughs> we come back to some unusual phenomena in nature. But what are we getting at? On that same tree of life, there are certain herbs there up in that mountain range that researchers are trying to analyze now. And we may get the data in the future as to what they're representing. And a lot of diseases that we know that are apparently puzzling to us may be resolved by the minerals that are in those plants. But what the purpose of the initiate life is that the apple when it grows and it bears a fruit, that fruit will be used for therapeutic purposes of type of injuries that may involve atomic burns. Donna, what happens then to um, the apple that stays the same and doesn't decompose and the apple that doesn't decompose but also goes green on top? Are they still planted? Or is that a different... If the apple remains firm mm -hmm. for up to two years, it will really break down after two years. But it, it's gone, it's passed the test for two years, which tells you that's a rebuilder. But you still have to plant it. Okay, what about if it's green? But it never breaks down and remains, half of the top is green, it grows a little bigger, and the odor stays in it all the time. It's never going to break down, you've got to mask it. That is a living master right there in Avatar. So that person is automatically in that state. And that's their job. Their job is here to be a cosmic 
nor smith or builder. Is that considered the sonic state and the apple that just stays the same would be the gaseous? Yeah. Was Yogananda then, because his body didn't break down, would he be considered on the gaseous frequency mm -hmm. then? And just one more question. We were talking about the apple a lot, so it's really some tonight, of course, that it comes up. But if, if um, the apple is in, say, the thermal or the fluid state, would you say that a person who had, had um, say, a thermal-type frequency as opposed to a watery, would there be a clash on the who level? No. So it has nothing to do with the... Um, no, no. Okay. No. Everybody in this group will fall under one of the four categories. And it doesn't have anything to do with competition. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, good or bad. It is your particular locking in to the atom in your particular time processes and your particular horoscope that you have to work with. Now, out there, there are non-initiates. They're the ones who are going to need it, not the initiate. The initiate know what, he, what to do. It's the non-initiate doesn't know what to do. They are passengers. Because if the, if the initiate has the ability to crystallize the atom with his voice, is he going to be a victim of atomic radiation? Then he's a fool. He's already been given the power to do what? Crystallize the atom with his voice, or her voice for that matter. So. You cannot be a passenger no more, you're a driver. And who is going to set up an atomic war? An initiate or a non-initiate? Good. So who are going to be hurt with the intent of that war? Non-initiates. Initiates are the ones who know the danger of the mistake and are the ones who are here to clean up, but they're given the power to correct it. Now in your Bible, it's written that the Son of God were the only ones that had the power of life over death. And uh, the non-sons of God didn't have the power of life over death. They were called the children of, uh, of man. So they, they said the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took unto them wives. Now who the hell are these sons of God? Where they come from? It means they are initiates. Those individuals who are initiated are the sons of God. They're the ones who light up. They're the ones who have the capacity to control the atom of the mouth. They will see their brothers and sisters who are not in that state. And they're, if they're going to extend this capability to their offspring, they'd have to marry a non-initiate. They don't necessarily have to marry initiates. So you had that like they did what was the Nephilim and they were they were giants among men. Mm -hmm. That's right. Not necessarily giants in size, <laughs> but giants in consciousness. In consciousness, oh, right. Wow. Okay. That's what the real uh, meaning of the thing. They were <coughs> capable of regulating the atom with their mouth versus the ones who were a victim of their society and uh, of their actions and had no way to stop the breakdown of their life by their mouth. But those people are forgiven. That's why Jesus went out and called his disciples to him, with who he initiates and says, Come, I'll make you fishers of men. I don't want you to go fishing on the road uh, in the river no more because that's only to eat. Or here is your brothers and sisters who are not the initiates, and you can't impose it upon them, but you could help them to pull their head out of the ground like an ostrich who doesn't know what the heck is chasing him. And assuming that there's some big gorilla, when it's only a, a little kitten, <laughs> but it'll stick its head in the ground and avoid confrontation. So many of us are in the non initiate uh, existence with fixations about ourselves, and we're not ready to really look at ourselves. When we're ready to look at ourselves and pull our heads out, that's the time when we say, when the student is ready, and that's the first you got to be a student willing to understand what he is or she is. When they are ready to do that, those who are already awakened will be there. They call them masters. I'm not your master. I'm your brother, but I have to master myself. I have to carry my own convictions to work out my own lifestyle. 
you have to carry yours to work it out. So each person is carrying his own cross or his own horoscope as a process of mastering it. But when he masters it, he declares, the Christ in me does everything and corrects it everywhere now. So it's not yesterday or tomorrow. Now is the, the thing that the Christ in me has to do. And if it doesn't accept it, he ain't accepting the machine. It's not accepting what they are. This. So the Christ power is a now principle. And the now principle is the statement of the spoken word to the atom. <coughs> and this being the temple of God, if God don't want to accept his own temple, then he can shove it. <laughs> See, if God don't want to uh, make a restitution to it, when you, the, the beingness, has the understanding, as Paul says, and not the uh, wishing, then it has to correct itself. So what is important is not to withdraw and hide in a corner and feel sorry or hold it down. It's to exercise this capacity now within the range of your consciousness you are Christ conscious. You are the living principle in the world of now. And while I'm in the world of now, I am the light of the world now because I am the atom. I am the integrator of the atom with the spoken word. I have been initiated by the power and the power has transferred to me my right to exercise it. So what I did in the past is already resolved. Otherwise, I wouldn't be given the power to be a driver behind the wheel. You can't get a permit to drive down the road if you didn't go learn to drive first, right? And you can't assume that you're a driver if the cop tells you, hey, you, you goofed in the light. Where is your driver's license? And you say, I don't have any. Then you, are, you deserve to be punished for driving a vehicle without a license. But if you have a license, you will assume your responsibility for crashing the light. You're not going to deny it if you're wrong. So that's basically your right also. So by virtue of this, as an initiate and being given the right to exercise the voice over the atom, with your full authority now, within the Christ power locked up <coughs> in you, you can exercise it on your health. You see, if all of us lie down dead in this room and God walks and says, Hi, fellas, what do you want? Your breath back? Some miracles to perform or uh, possessions to own, we're going to take. Yes. Good, tell me more. So then, if I'm going to take my breath, then I must have the power to exercise my right over my handicaps in my physical frame if I'm going to be a glory to you, God. And this is to the glory of God because the blind man was being healed, not because he, he committed a sin in the last life or his parents did. It's because he and Jesus is what, standing there right now facing each other. You get it? So if Jesus could not express his command over the atom, the blind man is entitled to what? The experience. Uh, what is he blind to? Is he really blind or is he not looking at the actual understanding of what he is? Yes. To be exact, that's what he, his problem is. When you don't look at what you are, and you don't state it to what you are, then you're blocking the reality of what you are. Okay, then if you're, if you're a doubting Thomas type, <laughs> like an Adana. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know nothing. <laughs> if you're a doubting Thomas type, then how do you get rid of the mountain of doubt? In other words, it's like if you have a mushy apple, if you had no doubt, you could transform that apple into the one with the green top. If you crossed that line and you assumed your own God self. But if you're a doubting Thomas type, how do you how do you get rid of that mountain of doubt? Doubting Thomas is not a doubter in the sense that he doesn't believe or he's not gonna check. Doubting Thomas was a term used to describe a man who was a scientist, highly educated Jewish person from a very highly intellectual family to the point that he was going to be a rabbi before he ever met Jesus. But Jesus diverted his attitude from his rabbinical studies to a more actual understanding of himself. So he was referred to as a doubting Thomas because he was too objectively specific, as you would say today, the scientists don't accept your convictions until you can test it in a test tube and then give a qualification. 
That's why he was referred to as a doubting Thomas. But that's not a bad uh, quality. It's a very sound quality in reference to being capable of being reliable to what you say you will do. So it has a value to doubt first and question, but not to deny the opportunity to test it and experience it. So therefore, you would be the first person to back it up after you test it because it has passed all the tests. But that sounds like a long way to get there. Ah. Uh -huh. <laughs> My friend, there's no something for nothing. And the something for nothing attitude doesn't get us anywhere. Because why? We are avoiding the confrontation of checking and validating <coughs> by personal experience. <coughs> now if you are perfect the very first time you did everything, how would you know when you are wrong? <laughs> hmm? You can't know when you are wrong. So but if you made a mistake and it doesn't work out, then the second time you are going to do what? Try to find out where the mistake is. And so that is what the, the term came in those days. But that's an agricultural term describing a person who had a scientific attitude to life. So it wasn't that he doubted, uh, okay. It's just the way they use it. He but, wasn't from Missouri. No. <laughs> but here's an interesting thing. If he was truly doubting, in the sense that doubting is being used, he would never aspire to the end of where he accomplished any real truth. Because remember, he's an initiate, number one. But he was, what you say, the scientific attitude type of an initiate. He wasn't taking things strictly by hearsay. When his teacher qualified the actual manifestation of the atom with the voice, and left them, Thomas left the Middle East and traveled to the Far East. His body is still existing today in a temple in Goa, India, which is known as Portuguese India today, and it doesn't decompose. And the Vatican didn't move it from Goa to the Vatican simply because that body is there in that Catholic Church, and it remains there as a memento to the contribution of Thomas' own mission to work among the sick and dying people of that part of the world. So that is evidence that Thomas did validate for himself as an initiate the power of the voice over the atom. And that is why we are saying that it is understanding something more in depth than what we are trying to relate to in terms of philosophy. It's a physics that is involving commitment to your own mechanism. Now, people can go there and get healed. <coughs> That's one way they can be healed. Uh, we are looking at other ways set up by nature for the correction of problems that will be coming in the future. And so, this particular way of the apple is being set up for the reduction of illnesses produced by atomic radiation in the future because we, we will not be able to avoid an atomic war but we could phase down the extent of its damage to society by virtue of our ability to resonate and control certain areas with our consciousness so that we can't stop the knife from cutting you because one side of the knife is sharp and the other side is a handle. You'd be a fool to take the sharp side and rub it across its face to see if it's the handle. So, so no amount of work yeah, can avoid it. I mean, in consciousness, there's not anything that we can do to crystallize that atom so it would not go into uh, a destruction prior to, to the time. Say right now. <laughs> right now. The human race, and that's the human race, not the human being. The human race is not equal in consciousness. But they have the same 
desire to exist. Individuals evolve independently by themselves to a certain level of control. Therefore, the problem is always within the individual. After they reach a certain level, they think they can correct everything for the human race. Even Jesus couldn't do it, and none of the realized masters could do it, because there's a difference between the human race as a whole thinking and an individual with a karmic pattern working out their own particular involvement. So who are these beings going to help? They're not helping the human race. Who are they helping? Those who are ready to what? Leave the passenger level of the human race and enter the initiate level of the human race. So those who are going to be helped first to have the power to manifest the control of the atom is the initiate. And who is the initiate going to turn on to help? Those who are the non-initiates in their particular time frame, if they want to be helped. Now, you can't help a person who doesn't want to be helped. <laughs> you know, good, good example. Jesus came to the Jews, right? Did he grab him and accept him right away? Remember he said, I came unto my own, and my own received me not. The very people that he's born and grow into, who would be willing to accept this opportunity to apply the spoken word over the atom, couldn't accept him. Because why? He's a threat to the ancestors and make an allegiance to a newcomer. And the newcomer would, could only convince them with certain conditions that would make them think it's magical or non-magical. So they'd be caught between two frames of mind. And they've been exposed already to magical things by their ancestors in the time of Moses. So anything more magical ain't gonna make it what? More convincing that they don't have the right to call upon the God. So naturally, <laughs> He doesn't have any audience in that particular group. Try as he wish, they would never listen. So, what does he do with his accomplishment? He turns around and looks. He says, I came unto my own, my own received me not. But as many, no matter who you are, Greek, French, whatever it is, initiate or non initiate, as many as receive me, right here and now, I'll give you this power. Even those who believe in my name, meaning even when I'm not here present in the human frame with you and I'm working with you, the mere fact that you hear my name, that I did exist, this particular contribution is extended to you based upon your acceptance of yourself. So that goes way into a, a dimension of where we hear of these great men leaving their commitment and we can use what they, is known as master charge. <laughs> That's the cosmic credit card. Okay, they are, they, they are given their word to back up what they say. So what does the modern day uh, uh, person do under those circumstances? In the name of the Christ, I accept my right to be healthy or whatever it is based upon the extended love of this great being who says, just accept my name, it's done. And that's what the love is all about. The love is to turn on the atoms in your body to work for you out of love. So what we're trying to say is this, the initiate is an individual who is turned on to his own atomic structure and would be of a service in the future to the non-initiate who may doubt or disbelieve even under the worst circumstances they find themselves, they may not want to accept any kind of a transformation. We have to have more tangible ways to help them in spite of themselves. And so the apple weird is a means of providing certain functions in the future. So the, if the apple comes from the tree that she plants, and since it represents dissolving, 
whenever that apple comes into existence and there is a human being hurt by any kind of a radiation that would require a solution process to phase it out of the tissue, then an apple of the dissolving frequency would be available to do it. The elements in there would be interactive atomically to phase it out. The same elements that could feed the body, the same elements that can make the body toxic, the same elements that can create destruction can be utilized for therapy. Now, what is an atom bomb? It's an atom of what? Element. Plutonium and hydrogen. Good. In a certain state, plutonium and hydrogen is very, very destructive to the human body. In another state, it's very, very essential for the existence of the human body. And in another state, it's corrective for any injury incurred by it on the human body. So therefore, the same element has many functions to destroy, to sustain, or to correct. So we see the polarity of the element going on all the time. But the time frame that we are in, when we are around the sun, in the moment of our particular uh, galactic movement, this is where our mind action is going to impose. So we are approaching the Aquarian age. But there is no such thing as Aquarian age, it's Aquarian cycle of the Iron Age, where iron as a metal would be so sophisticated in the Aquarian thinking that much of the destructiveness could be highly reactive very fast on the human body and we have no way how to phase it down unless there are compensatory actions going on. So there are many ways to compensate. We can <coughs> compensate by research with the actual mechanical machinery. We can compensate by raising the level of our awareness to work upon the atom directly through our own interaction of the spoken word. And we can raise the level of awareness by surrendering to the force field of daily confrontation in the form of pain and commitment. So the human body has three ways to resolve. Not to be afraid of pain, but to work through pain, to rise above pain to know the elements in the body, to direct them by certain uh, equipment or to reach the level with the spoken word that you can correct the very action of the element that is hurting you. Donna, does, does it apply the same in the principle of the coming and going at will? It's the way in which you'd even look at the sonics of the body? Because if you should come through the wall and our conscious mind would say you have a body, we'll still be thinking in terms of some sort of solidarity. So how, does, how is it we need to look at what the body is in terms of that coming and going at will? As an initiate at this moment in time, uh, you should be meditating to experience the non-solidness of the atom in the form of matter. That's your very first encounter with the, what you call third eye vision or convex vision or hologramic vision. So the non-initiate sometimes get this by an accident or blow on the head or by taking drugs. The initiate isn't taking drugs. He's supposed to go there actually by the process of oxygen where matter can be seen in its atomic structure by the internal convex vision. And that is why you are given the techniques to activate it. And as you approach that level, the validation <coughs> has to be there. So you're not using any kind of imagination or belief. So the second part of your me uh, meditation, after you've done the, the mantra, you're supposed to look for the inner eye and see the light and hear the sun currents of the atoms in your body. Now, you're supposed to watch it, and whatever appears in there, and I gave you already, there's a gold ring, there's a blue background, and there's a five-pointed star. The five-pointed star represents the five elements. 
to which this manifested frame must function and prove itself like a police system, like one of those things that you go through a, a airport there to check you out and see if you've got a phone here <coughs> again. So this is what you're doing when you check it. Now, they can't come in there and make pledges or promises and try to use you or give you all kind of fancy games. It's, it's not valid because they're, then they're not even evolved themselves. So if they are evolved and you see it, they have to make the contribution of giving you a valid, tangible experience of a transfiguration. Now, Jesus did that for his disciples as an initiate. And so the non-initiate may go into the other levels of exposure, <coughs> but for the initiate, that's not their road. The initiate's road is to see the being and have the tangible experience with the being and the being making the pledge of validity. Then you know they're not using you and your consciousness is raised up to their level of equalness. So there's no such thing, one being above the other. The master is not above the student, the student is not above the master, it's enough that they be friends. You, the initiate, and the realized person is an initiate of the same identical law and therefore the same identical experience. So one can say, hey, I can materialize and you say, and you can. No, no, no. That doesn't oh, so it applies then to the one who experiences it. So the tangible manifestation is the test. <coughs> and that is what you're working for because we, we're not interested in fooling ourselves with statements or any kind of a pseudo condition that will give us power over time. Yes. No, no, I'm, um, it's not that I'm a proponent of uh, any type of drug, but uh, I would think that a Yaqui Indian would differ in his perception as to the type of experience their religious tradition supports in reference to certain psychotropic um, plants that have been used historically within their tradition. I'm not going to condemn their method, but I've yet to see where they can crystallize themselves in front of me. Their best medicine man can do it, but I have done it for them. I went to their meeting, and I'm the first one that walked out through the top of their Hogan, leaving them all sitting down there wondering how the hell I could do it. Then the medicine man I looked down and said, you want to come or you want to stay with them? Then he had to force himself to come out. Or when we were both outside in the Hogan and the rest are inside, he says, brother, this way to God is entirely different. I says, yes, but we're not here to change the world. Let's go back in. We went back in, and that very day after, they put away their herbal stuff and began to use their nose. Uh, I might mention something about this comment that he just made there. Uh, psychotropic plants are not for that purpose. No. The only reason that uh, Don Juan ever talks about psychotropic plants in his books is because the person he was working with needed that for a boost. That's the only reason. They're not, they're not uh, used to gain any kind of... No, I understand that too because I'm well aware of what they're doing. Yeah. They, they use that mostly as a medicinal means for a person who can't slow down their brain enough to call upon their own internal uh, endorphins to heal themselves. But the, the real medicine man doesn't actually need it. He started off with it, but then in the end he doesn't need it. Because I've seen many of them who, who eliminated and dropped it off and went directly inside to awaken themselves after. But we're not here to condemn them. We're here to understand what level they're working with. And so, from these different levels, we know that the actual way that with the least side effect on the human body is respiration. Because no matter how many chemicals you put in your body, if you don't breathe, you ain't going no place. So when God put us all together, he put all 144 elements and they're all found in plants and all kinds of different things. But the human body has them all. So if you're looking for a psychotrophic element in a plant, 
you ain't gonna find anything more unusual than if I told you what a trace mineral was. <laughs> See, I know what a trace mineral is, but that's the actual mineral. So you can name 50 different plants with containing it, and you'll find them in all that parts of the world. But that's what it, one man's understanding is. He knows it as a plant. I know it as a trace mineral in the plant. And everybody says they use vitamin C. But I know the mineral inside the vitamin C. What makes a vitamin C a vitamin C? That's the big difference of knowing what the thing is versus who the thing is. You may need vitamin C to be capable of taking care of toxins in your body. But if you don't know what a vitamin C is made of, you can drink all the vitamin C and never get cured. But if you know what it's made of, you'll know when to put it in and the toxins will correct themselves. But that's the difference of what the thing is versus who the thing is. There are a lot of herbs that are considered psychotrophic. But the person who is using it may not know what is in the herb itself that performs the psychotrophic effect. There are only two types of minerals in this world, a basic mineral and a trace mineral. Psychotrophic drugs or plants fall under two categories. 30% fall under basic minerals and 70% fall under trace minerals. And your body contains them all, plus one more thing that the environment doesn't have. The environment is composed of 143 elements. A human body is composed of 144. That one extra element is, <laughs> name it. Good. It has power over the 143. <laughs> but you can't keep it because it's called God. But God is you. And resident as your conscious ability to use it. And only the initiate, one who is turned on to it, has this power. So basically, when a person is turned on to their actual sonic control, all 143 elements have to synchronize. But not before you're initiated, you wouldn't do that. Initiation is handing you the responsibility of your mechanism to your voice. <coughs> After that, you are liable for everything you say. <laughs> so, we're not going to condemn people who come up an ethnic way by utilizing certain means to arrive at certain experiences. We want to know more of what those experiences really represent and what is the structure of the experience. This is the big difference between belief and understanding. Many of us believe in God. How many of us understand God? God is not a person sitting on a throne waiting for dead people. He's already the tip of your nose. But that's what we have to understand what it is and why it is and why it became all these things. And we never become it. We who is only our personality or self-individuality. The totality is creative presence called spirit by American Indian. In the East it's called Brahma, <coughs> Brett or Jehovah, ID. That's what the word means, you know. Um, so what, Adana, in the Hopi prophecy, it seems like they're waiting for a being outside of their own to complete the picture. What is... No, that is okay. the uh, way they, they state it to those who hear them, but deep down in the brain of the medicine man, and I don't mean those who listen to the medicine, the medicine man himself. He knows it's an internal release of the human being to accept the oneness of the God in them. But until this internal release comes, there is no way to accept this experience. And it can only come by trial and error. So the medicine man knows that, but he is unable to explain it to the people around him because they are already limited with certain fixations from heritage and he can break it too fast 
uh, so he has to work with them. But if you take the medicine man and talk with him personally in the level he is, you'll see all the ritual uh, generally leads to self-understanding. It's you see what you have to work with it to understand it. To the layman wouldn't recognize that. But I have worked with them, so I know that they're all working towards a self-understanding. But again, it's hard to tell people to accept themselves right away. Would they start with maybe the young ones coming in if they were, but again, they'd have to be open, would they, to learn, because if they follow their patterns, even the medicine men then couldn't teach them. Well, you know why that is so? Uh, evolution is the outward expression of God. Involution is the inward expression of God. So if you were born a hundred years, you wouldn't evolve to age one. There would be no evolution, but you're born one year evolving to a hundred years. So you have to be programmed by your parents for all through until you take responsibility. But if you were born and you push your head out of the womb and come out and say, Hi, Mom, my name is Jackie Smith, and I'm 180 years of age, and I'm ready to get going. Where is that computer machine? You know, she says, Shut up, you bloody head, you. <laughs> <laughs> and you want to tell your peers off, you see? But that doesn't happen. <laughs> it, that's a backward function. <laughs> so we can't go that route. We have to come through the evolving route in a manifested organism in order to learn by trial and error. And that's how it's set up for us all. Now, this is the one big catch <coughs> to all beings. <coughs> because all beings are endowed by God, because God made man in his own image and likeness, male and female created them, and breathed into man breath of life, and man became living soul. He doesn't have a soul, and if he did have a soul, it's preposterous for the human body to save it, <coughs> or to contain it. So that we see why those statements were written in such a way, <coughs> and in an agricultural way, and was often misleading to the, person growing up. And we have to take what people say till we check it out ourselves to find out what actually is versus who we think it is. Man and creation falls under two categories. All men and women are a direct manifestation of God. And all of us are respiratory functions. But we're sent out to do one thing, go forth, multiply, and have dominion over the universe. But we were also given the power to manifest what we want by the spoken word. But we goofed up centuries ago. And in goofing up, the thing that causes us to goof up is the residue of the manifested thought. What do you do with it? If you can manifest anything you want, and don't know what to do with the residue, you're in a predicament. You read in the autobiography of a yogi where there was a young man who had the ability to materialize anything he wanted in gold plates. Gold spoon, gold dishes and everything, right? And this, after he fed people, and even when he went to a trade station, he would look at the, the person selling the ticket he says, hey, they're beautiful, and he would touch them, and, well, he wouldn't buy a ticket, and then when he walked away towards the train, as soon as he got to the uh, person who took the ticket, he would materialize one hand the man and get him board the train. But he would always call on a being called Hazrat. And now you know that's okay if you're looking for something for nothing. But they're not going to criticize him for that. That's the way he's coming in. But he discovers, even though he has this ability to manifest what he wanted, or whenever he needed it. He couldn't keep the dishes. He could visualize the best, most expensive dishes made out of gold and diamonds that would sell for thousands of dollars or rupees in India after he eat the meal. And whatever the crumbs or the bones or uh, crumbs left there, where are they going to throw it? 
And so the dishes didn't stay that he could go and sell it to make some money. They all disappeared again. So he found out he was what? A victim of what? An electrical fixation of his own brain. <coughs> he had no full command over the atom. But he was able to satisfy anyone who hung around him, if they were hungry, to give them an edible meal to eat. But they will always look at the plate disappearing. So they ate free food. But they were always worrying about security at night where they're going to sleep. Or something to pay the bill. So you, they have to keep materializing. That story is in your other biography of a yogi. There's something for that in attitude. Now, to take it the next step further, Jesus came to his own people. He wasn't going to be caught in that predicament because he knew that they are going to challenge him. So, when he saw them all around him, he felt compassionate to feed them as a guest. So he turned to one of his students and says, how much money you got to buy some bread? So, that means he can't counterfeit money. And whatever he's got, he's got to go buy it. That's valid. So the student went out and realized he didn't have enough money to buy bread for 4,000 people. And he came back and said, we don't have enough money. So said, okay, All right, I can't materialize money because it belongs to Caesar. What have you got to eat? I can't make what you ain't got. Because I don't know what you want to eat. So your desire is all I'm going to crystallize. So a little boy showed up. I got this. Look at that. Lunch bag. Mommy gave me my lunch bag. What's it, son? Oh, some fish and some bread. Fine. Okay. This is what the society eats. Fish and bread. Put it there. And he amplified it. Then he turned to his students and said, now share it with them. Now, this could satisfy visual, five senses, hearing, smelling, and tasting. But if they're going to be a victim of their imagination, there shouldn't be anything left to clean up. Because fish has bones, and bread has crumbs. That's tangible. And yet, in order to show them that he was a master of the atom and not a master of the imagination, they had to pick up the crumbs and the bones. That's the residue. No. They didn't like that. Because, you know, 4,000 people throwing bones and crumbs in the ground. Man, that's a heck of a place to clean up. And you can't do it in 24 hours. So they didn't tell you how long it took them to clean up their bones and crumbs. But they said they pick up 12 baskets full. Now, you know, they didn't say how big the baskets were. <laughs> but they had 12 baskets as evidence that they clean up their residue. So this tells you they had to be actually working with the atom and not guessing. And so when he did this, he left them with the awareness that they were not a victim of imagination, that they really were experiencing tangible accomplishment of the spoken word over the atom, which they as an individual had the right to if they became his student or initiate. Now he's offering them the opportunity, as many as receive me, as many as accept, fine, even those who just hear my name, granted. So this is within the range of the individual. Now, if he doesn't back up his own word, then he's a phony. You and I as an individual can claim that by the master charge statement. The word has been said by him. We are here to take the word and apply it to our own lives. So for that reason, we have every right to say to ourselves, I am well and functioning with full capacity in every level to my utmost good. Now, so if you don't exercise it, then you get left out because you may have some notion that you don't feel you're worthy. That ain't true. Mm -hmm. Everybody is worthy who accepts 
his opportunity to apply the spoken word. Regardless of what you believe or don't believe in, this is your opportunity. Because the, the guarantor has already granted his decree. And it would be like a person who you may be a relative of this person and this person has left you in their will. But all they left you in their will or this tremendous big huge estate is a credit card. Would the estate refuse to honor the credit card when it's used by you, the inheritor? Hmm? I don't think so. So if we are the sons of God and our brother came and left us a credit card for us to use, only have to refer to his name, would you refuse to use it? And would the guarantor of the estate refuse to acknowledge the use of it after you use it? I don't think so either. Because I've proven it. That Jesus backs up everything he says. But what is more important, he doesn't want us to worship him as a glorified being. He wants us to accept the equalness of our nature with him. That's why he said, he that doeth the will of the Father is my brother and my sister and my mother. And he that followeth my word is my student. But the student is not above the master, nor a master above the student is enough that we be friends. Putting everybody on an equal level in reference to the ability to use the spoken word over the atom. Well, where do you use it primarily? In your health, because that's all that comes in the body, breathing and physical health. And you have that right to exercise it. So that's why we say we can exercise this principle and build our own reality. And the initiate has that opportunity more so than the non-initiate. The non-initiate is a passenger. But we, the driver, can't leave the passenger <coughs> stranded, so we offer them the opportunity to be drivers of their own vehicle. <coughs> and we do offer them compassion by helping them to overcome their handicaps. So, you, last time you talked about hope, faith, and then charity. Hope, hope being desire. Let, let's say you have the, the desire. And you have the faith, and you have the belief that charity. it's possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, what keeps you going when we're locked into time and space? Okay? In other words, Christ could manifest the, the fish and the bread instantaneously. It may take us take one a year, two or three years to build the body back up just by talking. And it's how do you hang on? I mean, is the, I don't know if I'm clear, but it's like. The faith gets a little bit shaky when it's not instantaneous the way it's supposed to be. I mean, why should it be now? Why should it not be now? I'm not, so I'm asking the question. The question is, you're depending on faith. You're not depending on hope. You can get a blow on your head and lose all your faith. But if you have hope, your faith will come back to you. But if you lose your hope, you have no faith to restore it. Because without hope, faith wouldn't work. So it's which of the two or three conditions that take priority in the mechanism. Is it faith taking priority or hope taking priority? <coughs> it's like your body. Your liver is a very important organ. It operates from uh, 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the morning as the start of the day. And your lungs operate from 3 to 5. Yet, between your liver and your lungs, which you think is, takes priority in the body? Lungs. Yeah? Your lungs, good. So the biological clock reads from 3 o'clock and not from 1 o'clock at night. So you can have the best liver and you don't breathe the barrier. You can have all the faith in the world and you have no hope, they'll bury you. So did the person lose the faith to live or they lose the hope to live? Desire. 
So you see what takes priority. Even though it's set up faith, hope, and charity, the priority is hope, faith, charity. Then what the mind says is that uh, you're being mind, I should say. Says that that's, that's ego. That's like you're playing God or you're in trying to manifest where there might be a little bit of cleanup, but I can stick it in the garbage can and nobody know it would be there. Right. Like an apple or a cup. Good. <laughs> you know, so there's no cleanup psychologically. I mean, if it's going to happen, it's only going to happen. I'm the only one who's going to know, right? But the, the, there's something, there must be a mustard seed of doubt. It could be subconscious. Could we be fully convinced consciously that this is all possible? And intellectually, it makes sense. It's, it's atomic structure. But still be driving with the break on because of the subconscious or something else. I mean, have we got everything here to make this happen? <laughs> Consciously. Even if you have it all, ask yourself this question. Would you test it to see if it works? <clears throat> hmm? Have everything in front of you, ready to go. Will you test it to see if it will work? Sure. You sure? I think I feel like, I feel no. like I would. No. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, 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 you're no. talking. Why, really why wouldn't you? It's because you fall asleep. Oh, God. <laughs> if you don't fall asleep, you... <laughs> you will do it. Because you see, you fall asleep every night, and you don't know who the hell you are before you wake up. You ain't got no guarantee you can do it. That is what you got to overcome, Fred. You have to overcome the fooling of yourself every night that you need to sleep. That's why he criticized his, his old students for nothing else. He didn't even criticize He never had any other criticism for them other than that one thing. Could you not pray a while with me? You all fall asleep. And that's the only real test of this mechanism being incompetent <laughs> in making the atom work for it. Because it surrenders its devotion of loving God with all of the mind. Now you can't love God with all of your mind if you're going to fall asleep. You're entitled to fall asleep or be born sleeping as a child. <laughs> and during that level you could be the non-initiate. But the moment you attempt into the level of the initiate, you can't fall asleep on the wheel. <laughs> you get an accident. <laughs> you jig is up. Right, okay. So you don't go monkey around sleeping on the wheel. <laughs> you see, you had a period where you could sleep, and the other period is inward awareness. So by and large, the action of no sleeping, and don't let the word no sleeping be a threat to the mechanism. It's just a statement of non Relating inwardly is not practical. You've got to be constantly relating to yourself inwardly at every moment. That's why they say loving the Lord with all of the mind. There is no moment that you could think of something else to face it down <coughs> or suppress it. And when you are relating inwardly, you are not analyzing. Mm. You are photographing. So, inward love of God is witnessing. That's why they refer to the true lover of God as a witness. They couldn't describe it any better in their terminology than to use the word witness, which means to watch. Internally, loving God all the time is like a camera, not like a computer, because a computer analyzes. But a computer can't replay B if you punch A. Mm -hmm. You have to get B if you punch B. You got to get A when you punch <laughs> A. A camera <coughs> isn't concerned if it's a dog or a mouse or a tree. It's looking at whenever you press the, the, <laughs> the lever, that's how it's going to photograph. Otherwise, it can keep looking. Like, you ever <laughs> see those cameras they have in the stores that is watching you? <laughs> so it's a type of equipment function that you have inside in terms of awareness, the self-watching. It's called self-watching. And it's conscious. And it's all. So it doesn't have any way to phase off and go into a, a shutdown state. 
So for that reason, the, the, the teacher is telling the student that is the ideal state to aspire to. Oh, so, that, so then we know that we are starting to get control over our atomics yeah. so when we can go without sleep. That's right. Before that, we don't have any control. No. Now, the razor's edge is based on the same thing to the end of the book. He spent the whole 24 hours up in the mountain getting to a non-sleep state to find out if he's going to be enlightened. Uh, yeah. And the word enlightened didn't mean he got smart or he got more wisdom. It simply means he lost the ability to sleep and feel stupid. <laughs> and that's the enlightenment. <laughs> Then, Adano, taking that to the next step of um, any being that goes on vacation, this was something that Linda um, was listening to a tape years ago in the Phoenix. And then I was just trying to understand Yogananda going on vacation. Mm -hmm. And say some of the masters presently in India, mm -hmm. when you ask the students, will they leave this plane? The answer is always, well, yeah, because they're going to drop the body. Understanding what you say, it seems like, why would one want to drop the body? Would they want to have life eternal now, midnight eternity? Um, could you Remember, we're coming out from a Piscean cycle and moving into an Aquarian cycle. And the language that was used to describe what we are was not very specific. Therefore, a great deal of beings were locked into different interpretations of the language. As we become more specific and clarify what we are, we no longer use those terminology to describe what the experience is supposed to be. And by this understanding, the experience of what you are becomes quicker, better, and more functional every moment you use the correct statement instead of the old Piscean statements. The new uh, terminology is far more exact and far more experiential as an experience than the old terminologies. The old terminologies are not very experienced. They're too guilt-ridden and locked in with a lot of frustrations and doesn't take any sense of commitment. Whereas the new terminology frees you from guilt which is a major drain on your mechanism and gives you the sense of commitment which is an accomplishment feeling which motivates you into action. Then wouldn't, why wouldn't some of, just to understand then, some of, here you are uh, in the now expressing this out to the creation for anybody that's ready to hear it, then why wouldn't some of the other maybe teachers sort of put that out too also, like because it, it just change, just revamp, like go with a bit more revamping, you know? I'll tell you why. Okay. It can't, everybody can't be the same. Oh, okay. If you wanted to get a PhD from a, a certain university, would it be the same curriculum in another university? Or is it going to be different? Different. But if I was But they're teaching... all going to give you a degree in PhD, right? Mm -hmm. But they'll want a certain things to be different. And yeah, that, but wouldn't you want to give, if I was teaching in a university somewhere and I was giving out information which I knew to work to that time and then I go to another university and I hear you and I go, wow, this guy, he he's, knows what he's talking about. So I'll go back and then give that information out because I know yours is going to speed it up, but speed the, thing the process is this, up. Remember, each teacher <clears throat> or individual that is giving out information is giving it out for a specific reason to uh, individual who needs to hear it in that frame of reference. Oh. All of us can't hear it scientifically specific. We aren't ready for it. Some of us need to be coached through the uh, agricultural language in order to break free from those fixations. So they may know it, the beings over there may know it with you, but they're doing their job and they will help in that <coughs> way rather than give it up. Exactly. So it's, uh, you are ready to grasp it scientifically. There are many out there who aren't ready to grasp it uh, scientifically. They still want the agricultural language to give them a sense of commitment or feeling of need. So where you are, to what level you can handle it, that's what you're working with. Now, I didn't want agricultural language when I met Yogananda. 
because I could see where agricultural la uh, language describing God made me feel happy. It made me more miserable and always feeling guilty for something I didn't do. <laughs> <laughs> so when he came along for the first time in his book uh, and gave scientific uh, description of the truth, it, it rang a bell in my consciousness. Here is the first time somebody saying something I know is valid. But then I wanted to go see him and study with him. Then he writes and tells me, don't come and see me. Stay where you are. <laughs> so that tells me right away, uh, association isn't always the, the role. Work and confrontation is a role. So I had to work with my own mechanism and confront my daily actions. And then I understood what Jesus meant when he said, pick up your cross and follow. He just said, pick up mine. If I pick up Jesus' cross, he'd be sitting down here talking to you now and I'd be nailed to the cross when I'm long gone. Right? <laughs> But we are doing that. He was nailed and I'm sitting here. But we all got the same process to carry on. Just as you are sitting here. See? So wherever you are in the time frame of now and working out the understanding, that's the most important moment. What has happened in the past had to happen. What your parents did to you or gave an opportunity for you to come through, that had to be the road. But we don't criticize the parent, and we don't criticize the fact that we made misapplied decisions in a previous life to be where we are now. What is important now, that this moment is the culmination of our total understanding of what occurred, and is the opportunity to be capable of living it now. That you can live the experience now, with an understanding, not with a belief. Do you believe you eat with your teeth or your nose? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Try something. Yes, some juice for it. Good. Okay. <laughs> some people smell the food over there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's not belief. Uh, and drink with your ears. Help yourselves and move around. <laughs> if a master is working with sonics like the Christ or Kabir. Well, well, clear up first thing when we use these words, what are we saying? Okay, I'm using the term that you've said in relationship to the say a master. Or a being. It simply means a human being who has mastered the ability to live what he says. Don't go make it more than what it's not. Once they have lived what they have said, they have command over the atom by the spoken voice. And therefore they have no other alternative than to function here as a compassionate person. Now, we the individuals who haven't mastered it look to them as a superior being. They look at us as a brother who doesn't want to accept responsibility. So they don't look at you as any student. You're a brother of theirs that don't want to accept the responsibility of your spoken word. So they're going to dump it back on your head and tell you, don't call them masters. All they have done is master the art of living the spoken word. And they want us to accept that responsibility and make it a living experience for ourselves. And, so, and they set the example they set to the show example, you can right? be done. Right. All right, so if a brother... In other words, they are an elder brother. Okay. If an elder brother is working with the son on the sonic level, mm -hmm. or yeah. the apple that grows, right. like, let's use Christ. Mm -hmm. okay. um, can take the, the, the machine or yeah. this atomic structure mm -hmm. with them. Okay. Where they, they don't leave any cleanup. They don't leave any residue. Yeah. Okay. Then there's a brother who is, if I understood you correctly earlier, that's working in the gaseous, with the gaseous, who leaves a form, but the form doesn't decompose. Yeah. Okay. Can that brother, having left this non-decomposing 144 elements on a yeah. slab, right. rematerialize in, in 144 elements at will. 
Yes. Because why? Xeroxin is unlimited. Oh, Xerox so is, Xerox is unlimited. So then, okay. So, so then, what is the? Why would one brother leave, leaving no cleanup, and another leave choose to leave the form that doesn't decompose, and may or may not come back to people in the Xerox copy? What, what's what's the the purpose of the difference? That's what I'm. Thinking. That is to satisfy the onlooker. The option is millions of ways to take it. But what the onlooker needs to satisfy or give them some confirmation or hope, this <coughs> is what they may leave to them. Now, some individuals leave the body for others to experiment with. Others take it so you don't know if they ever existed or it's a figment of your imagination. See, this is their option. Mm -hmm. Now, some remain here, ain't going no place, but only visible or invisible when you need, they need you to see it. Like Babaji. Yeah. So this is their option. What they're trying to convince their brothers and sisters is once you live the spoken word, you are a free individual, free men all, Lord of the cell. And to be Lord of the cell and to be free is to take it with you, leave it to show that it doesn't really break down and you have the option to Xerox all over the place, or be visible or invisible at will. Beat me up, Charlie. <laughs> Donna, what if, what if a uh, brother, though, um, what if I go on vacation and I leave my body so somebody would either have to bury it in the ground or burn it? What does that mean? In other words, why would I want to have some, that? Wouldn't that indicate if you either burn or bury it that you haven't taken full responsibility because somebody else has to do something with that, don't they? Yes. I mean, and other people have to, yes. you know, the crematorium or the burial place have to do right. it. But this is just the option you have. So it do you want to leave it around for others to believe or be convinced that you were, were saying the truth when you were here with them? Or do you want to take it with you and let them puzzle in their mind? You never did come, but <coughs> it's possible you might have been here because your old clothes are still hanging in the closet. And this is what your picture looked like. But we ain't got no body to show that you actually was here. This is the puzzling truth. But this is your option. Once you have re arrived at the freedom of the spoken word over the atom, however you want to leave <coughs> some type of conviction for your brothers and sisters, this is your option. You are not restricted. The only time you're restricted is if you rot after you die. And then they know you didn't make it. <laughs> but if you don't rot, they know you made it, and therefore you have the option again of Xeroxing it. And if you take it with you, and they don't have no actual evidence you were here to show outside of your old clothes or a picture of what you would look like, this again is your option. If you want to be visible or invisible, whenever you need to be, no matter how long you want to stay on the planetary system, this is your option. Well, if the body's buried, doesn't it rot in the ground? But So you're saying uh, a person atomically could still have the body buried under the ground. And never rot. And never rot. But if it does rot... Then you didn't make it. Okay, and what about if it's cremated through burning? There's if it's cremated, you can Xerox it again. Now, the Yukishwar Xerox is after they cremated. Yeah. Then Lahiri Xerox is after they cremated. Okay. To show that the Xeroxing principle overrides the fixation. Now, there was a guy by the name of uh, <coughs> Kabir. He lived a long time ago, around 1600, and he went around trying <coughs> to unite Hindus and Muslims 
because they had two different belief systems into accepting the one God in themselves. Now for years he preached to both of them. And finally one day he decided he's going to leave the body. So he stood up in front of them, gave a long lecture on the unity of God and lie down there in the tomb. Now the Hindus said right to the crowd of people, he was us. He is one of us, and by our rights and belief system, we must cremate the body. The Muslims got up and said, oh no, he was with us. He lived and he taught us, and by our concepts, we bury the body. After many hours of arguing back and forth to bury or cremate the body, Kabir got up and looked at them, shook his head, and disappeared right in front of their eyes. But he left them two roses in the coffin. The Hindus took their roses and cremated it. The Muslims took their roses and buried it. The coffin is still there to this day, empty, and they don't know where the hell Kabir gone. <laughs> <laughs> See? What fixation will do to the reality of ourselves. But Kabir lived. <coughs> the records of his existence were, and the people who were helped by Kabir have records of it. But the body of Kabir is not present. But they have the buried rose and they have the burnt up ashes of the other rose. And they have the coffin still there in the Middle East where Kabir lived and nobody to show. Now he was not the only one that did that. Jesus did the same thing too. But he didn't leave nothing else but a, a, a clot, which they call the Shroud of Turin now. With what his face supposed to look like, or his body, where the actual perforation or the cuts or the nails were. And that's evidence that he was nailed on a cross. So many of these men realize that their brothers and sisters are not willing to accept the reality of themselves as yet, <coughs> would leave something tangible to confuse them or impress them or take it with them so that they don't have any way to vouch for their existence. But this is their option, their freedom. But you, it falls under three categories. To leave something <coughs> or not to leave something or to be present among them and only visible when it's necessary to be visible. And the fourth situation, everybody is subject to that rut. And that would be the moth for something for nothing? That's right. So if our apple does anything but <laughs> stay... <laughs> Wait, you set the theme for the evening. <laughs> if the apple does anything but stay firm or grow, mm -hmm. then that, the nature of that apple with work yes. would change. Yeah. In other words, if you could hang on to it long enough and you did the work, it would, it would reconstitute, That's come adamant. back to life, in other words. All right, here's a story not too long ago. <clears throat> a young couple married many years ago and were celebrating their 85th birthday together. And the minister who was remarrying them in the celebration knew them to be a very old couple. And when they came and asked him to do the ceremony over in memory of the anniversary of their marriage, to his amazement, as soon as he pronounced them man and wife, their whole physical anatomy and physiology went right back to 32 years of age. <laughs> and they are actually on record, the only people they have ever seen anything like that. Now they're asking the scientific facts, what do really happen? Can the human body revert back to a younger body after living so long in love and harmony together? And the answer is yes. Every human body has it locked up in the DNAs and RNAs. Instant rejuvenation is possible for the human body at 84 years of age. But at 82 years of age, 
you have to live two years of unconditional love. All the things that the world has done to you, those two years you have to totally forgive them and don't have a single thought in your mind for any kind of compensation or revenge. And at the end of the 84th year, your whole body and the DNAs and RNAs will go right back to 30. But that's a fact locked up in your body. It's called the salamander effect. Mm -hmm. What is it? The salamander effect. Salamander. You know what a salamander is? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. You've heard of it. It's an animal or a reptile that has the ability of revitalizing itself after it's gone through its full mature life form. And it replaces any part that has been cut off so it will never be minus a part of its anatomy. And your body has it because you are a print off of the same principle of the DNAs and RNAs locked up in you. But the only reason why we don't seem to have the capacity to reactivate these principles that the animal kingdom or the bird kingdom carries in them to do naturally is because we being endowed with a spoken word to have command over the atom did not live the spoken word and therefore all the misapplied decisions that you made you have to account for there are no sins there are only misapplied decisions so a great sister once said to me, Adana, when you know God, all your good and lousy decisions are fulfilled. <laughs> I said, thank you, sister. I appreciate that very much. I, I don't have anything to worry about anymore. So when you know God, that's when you know the truth that the mouth is the key to the atom. And whatever you say, it will crystallize then every good or lousy decision would be crystallized. So you don't have anything to worry about. It. It's there for you to live. And if you look back, we made a lot of lousy decisions when we were young. We tried to make good ones now as you get more mature. Yeah. Isn't there, um, wouldn't that also apply toward things that you were asking for? Now, I mean, isn't that, isn't that bound to happen as well? Is it better not to ask for things? <laughs> <laughs> or to wait to ask for things <laughs> until you come for the ulcer. We were told by our brother how to ask, but we never do it. That's why we never get the right answers. Brother Jesus told you how to ask. Do you remember what he said when he was in the body? How to ask? In his name. Hmm? In his name. In his name, right. He says, whatever you ask when you retreated to your innermost chamber. Well, you know, your innermost chamber in your house is a toilet bowl. <laughs> there ain't no more innermost chamber than that. That's right. It's so intimate with you, you couldn't go any closer than getting down to the nitty gritty of what is bugging you. And if you really ask in his name, it's done unto you. I don't want to sound crude, but many of us go to that toilet bowl and don't, go to, don't get no release. But if you ask in Jesus' name, you sure can get a power movement. <laughs> a lot of people did do it too and prove it and get a good uh, healthy bodies again. Because so then come around my clinic and said, Dano, I know what you mean now. <laughs> but literally speaking, if you slow down your brain and sit down in your room and ask for what is your highest good in the name of the Christ principle, I'd say this, it happens to you because you're entitled to it. Initiate or non-initiate. So instead of asking for something specific, you'd always qualify it as if it's for my highest good or if it's for the highest good. 
If you knew what your highest good would be, you wouldn't ask for it. Yeah, that's true. It will always be obvious to you. <laughs> but since you don't know what your highest good is, you have to ask for it and let it occur. So that's what you have to build up in your mind, that whenever you ask in the creative consciousness that your highest good be revealed to you, it will be revealed to you. But if you are willing to take the time out to analyze what can be the highest good for a human being, you'll find that the highest good for a human being is to breathe. Think of it. So why ask for your highest good when you're already breathing? Then why not do what? Love the Lord for the opportunity to have become you to breathe. So that's why Jesus said, all the, the commandments are great, but I give you a better one. And then the better one was, love the Lord thy God with all of the mind, no fall asleep now. Don't worry if you, <laughs> you see, because if you love it, you can breathe. Uh, see, that automatically makes you breathe. With all of your mind, you got to be breathing. And with all of your heart, that means your heart got to pump blood. You got to be breathing. And with all of your strength, well, if you don't breathe, you have no strength. <coughs> and with all of your soul, this is the integrity of your nature. Because you don't have a soul, you are a soul, and that's the honesty of yourself. You are going to be constantly breathing. See? And so this is truly the highest good. Now, if you're constantly breathing, can they bury you? No. <laughs> And if you're constantly breathing till midnight eternity, will they ever bury you? So you see, immortality is only locked up here, in the opportunity to be constantly breathing. But it's too simple to accept. <laughs> but when you actually understand what you're saying to yourselves, you see, there is no magic, it's just a matter of taking it step by step, breath after breath. It's been clouded so much so with all this. With all these words, right. you, we just can't see it. Right, and until you see the obviousness, the, yeah. the thing is so very nebulous. But that's why you have to clear out the nebulousness of the, the language and then see the actual truth. And it's not who you are, but what you are. So we're going to be here until midnight eternity because Big Daddy doesn't go out of business. So if he doesn't go out of business, where the hell are we going to go? He, we can't, he can't put us no place. <laughs> we can only shut down our individuality into a condition called non-relating, non-consciousness called death. We cannot shut down our totality because that is God itself. How can you shut down God, the totality of you which is life? So I'm a God of the living, Jesus said. My God is of the living, not of the dead. It would be highly preposterous to have a principle set up to phase out itself. It would be, have to be a principle that will be here in permanency. And the principle would have to be a single principle. One is the only number that can't phase itself out. Divide one by one, and what you got? One. You still got one? <laughs> so where is it going to go? And you are one with it. Therefore, you are the same principle. I and the Father are one. The I in you is the principle in you. So where are you going to go? But you're going to have the opportunity to breathe, to recognize it. And you want that to come into understanding of your consciousness, so you appreciate it moment to moment by loving the opportunity. So that's how come he says, love the Lord, love the I-ness that is singularly set up as you, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. <laughs> so that, that means it, it doesn't become unconscious. It is totally ever conscious. And lovingness is watching. Because you can't own it. <laughs> you can't be uh, possessed out of it. It's not possible. So as long as you're breathing, 
<coughs> and watching, then the heart is in a state of reverence. Then the, the breath itself, which is a strength to stay in that reverence, is continuous. Then the integrity of the honesty with yourself, knowing that you don't have to pretend to breathe. You're breathing. <laughs> Plain and simple breathing. You're one with the truth. Then your neighbor as yourself. Anything next to you is subject to the same laws. It doesn't matter if it's man, woman, or tree. Or These are objects next to you. And they have the same condition to live through. And you have to reach out and accept them as reflections of you. And why? Because the same I am principle is locked up in them. The same connotations and involvement of functioning is locked up in it. And they are just a reflection of what you have recognized, what you understand you are put together as. So the freedom is there automatically. So you're not here working to save anybody. You're working primarily to what? Find yourself. Good. So, Donald, then the whole idea of reincarnation would be just um, the sort of the not seeing that it's all taking place now, midnight eternity. So, as one would forget God, you might say, they go on vacation and they will wait to get back to the breath or body so that they can wake up again because they're in the dream until that point. So, and they will keep dreaming, which the lifetimes are the same as the dreams at night until they wake up. Yeah. And then they're told whenever they wake up, what they did was the most simple thing they could have done a long time ago. Seek the kingdom of God, which is inside of them, and it, how it operates, is righteousness. That is, look at your body and see what makes it function and how it operates. And it will free you from all the so-called fixations of what you think you can acquire or overrule. If you want to show off with your behavior, you'll sooner or later find out that your breath is all you can look at inside of you that keeps you functioning. And it makes you feel that you can own the world or be the greatest talkative person in the world or perform all that. But that breath will make you see it. And then after a while, you don't need to perform miracles or you don't need to own a single thing. Your breath provides you opportunity to live life consciously, free men, women, Lord of yourself. And in that state, the highest Opportunity is the breeding to experience ever new joy. Ever new joy means the opportunity to use ever new models. Think of that last statement. The opportunity to use ever new model, not to own it. Would you not like to have a new model equipment? <clears throat> coming to you every time to get you more opportunity to see the work you're doing. That'd be nice. That's what I mean, Ever new model, because the creativeness is ongoing and the opportunity to use it is there. <coughs> but as I say, you're going to own it all the time, it'll break down. So you really can never own anything outside, even if they all fall apart at some point. But the opportunity to use it in its ever new models, this is our option, this is our right. I couldn't own nothing, but I can have the opportunity to use it. And in the opportunity to use it, the, the need is provided already. The need is the want. The need is provided to take care of the opportunity to use it. Like Yoganada, when he first he was in a, a brand new Cadillac after the war, and it was funny how this thing, here he is coming out of this Cadillac and all these people are around him, and you know, one man is saying his mind, if he's a swami, why is he driving in a brand new cat like you know, that's sort of a Rajneesh this time, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so he looks around and he, he sees the man and he read the man's mind and he surprises the man by calling him by his name. He says, Mr. Johnson. And they're going to shock up. He says, I didn't ask for this Cadillac. 
It's given to me as a present. In fact, it's a very poor expression of man's creativity. Looking forward to a better model next year. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's too I, that, this has cured me of fixation to uh -huh. own. Uh, I want to be in the position to use it. Yeah. And so the models come up every time to be used. <laughs> <laughs> so, when you place a limitation on yourself, then it's a limitation. But if you don't do that, and you put the consciousness to flow, then the consciousness flows to work. And that's what they're trying to tell us all, that we must turn this attitude on as initiates. We must develop this consciousness, that a spoken word is our privilege, our inheritance over the atom. The other day somebody brought me a book and inside the book was a cartoon and they said the cartoon reminded them of me. So I read the cartoon and it was this. I am the only brick that doesn't break down, it's called a diamond. Oh, that's <laughs> too much. I want it. <laughs> so that was the cartoon. <laughs> so you don't break down, you're a diamond. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we have a question back here who really wants to help this cause. You get to go back and down? All right, take it anytime. You see, if you're worried about what you can do, you yeah, never do it. You're not doing it, right? <laughs> and if I'm worried about how it will feel, I'm, not, like, I'm never going to feel it. So I'm gonna enjoy. Well, you know that I'm getting more out of this than you, right? Oh, so, I, 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 you know that. I thought that's the whole idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Breathe, breathe. Can you send me March? March? Yeah. Oh, you'll be here all week. Yeah, I'll be here all week. Come and see you. Actually, he never leaves, you see. Oh, he's, he's never not here. I want to know, can you be in three or four different places, your multiple places now? <laughs> the answer is yes, but the condition of being aware depends upon your ability to recognize what you're saying to yourself and that has to do with how toxic the body is because the unified field is omnipresent already but we are not always conscious that of you're what, uh, where you are at that moment and the purpose of the meditation is to free the brain from the first two levels of speed that's the beta level the alpha level and the Finally, the theta, so you can get into the delta level where your consciousness. Your brain, you know. So you have to slow the brain down to four cycles a second to experience it, but it can be experienced. It's to the ability to stay in delta for 15 minutes. That's where they give you your degree. In other words, each person entering the delta level for 15 minutes is master. In other words, it, it, that's the real school of life. And that's the real examination you have to pass. Getting down to Delta and staying here for 15 minutes. You can't stay anywhere. Mm -hmm. I can't. Is that the Cosmic Oscar? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 15 minutes. Do you so. come and deliver it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not very long, but it's a lifetime. Oh, it's a lifetime when you're trying to be in there. Don't worry. Don't you have till midnight Don't panic. Yeah, we got till midnight. Don't panic. Don't panic. Don't panic. Right. Is that 84 years have anything to do with the 84,000 species? Yeah. Oh, jeez. With the 84,000 what? Species. Oh. What's the 84,000 species? There are 84,000 life forms. Okay. On this planet? Did we evolve through them? We did? Mm -hmm. Well, no. Um, there's 84 million. Oh. Eight, 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 eight million. million. 8,400,000. Yeah. 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 And our consciousness has so we, been We've come through all these different right up to the human form. 
but uh, it's set up by physics already in your DNAs and RNAs for you to have what is called spontaneous reversion of cellular rejuvenation based upon the non-conditional love from 82 to 84. The brain must function in a non-sleep state for two straight years between 82 to 84 in an unconditional love state and it's a cellular reversal in other words that's the cost you pay to be eternally young all the time why did they go to 32 why did they go to 21 or 20? the saturn return oh. is 30 oh, okay. and jesus came and lived in 32 which is his first process where cosmic consciousness is you have three states from 30 to 35 is the first state. <coughs> 45 to 65 is the second state. And 80 to 95 is the third state. Now, the third state is the compensation. The first two you have to work for. Mm -hmm. So if you don't make it in the first two stages and you do get up to 80 to, to 95, that's a compensation. And the compensation would be if from 82 to 84, you live an unconditional love attitude for those two years, the DNAs and RNAs puts this up as an actual rejuvenation and cosmic awareness. It's a gift from God. Well, did they, did, were they working towards it or did it just happen? Uh, this is set up by nature already. Yeah, the but I mean, this set couple, up to become a butterfly. The couple that, yeah, that they happened, didn't know that they, they didn't know it. But their love came from the mm. fact that they lived till they reached that wow. age and they wanted to go through again the ceremony of their marriage. Huh. And the minister performed the ceremony <laughs> and right to his own amazement. <laughs> there it is. But uh, you know, the yeah. But did they not sleep for those two years or was it just an exceptional case? I'm getting technical here. The more mature in life you become, and the more the relationship is togetherness, then you, you, you very don't. seldom sleep. Yeah. Because I've been around grandparents. Yeah, yeah. my parents yeah. are like that. They're up all night long. I don't see any grandparents sleeping, but it's their, their daughters and their sons and their grandchildren are all sleeping. Yeah. And you spend the night talking to them. And I said, well, we're, we've passed that stage. Yeah. We don't feel the need for it. Yeah. But the child, their own children, wouldn't even know that the grandparent, their mother or father, is not sleeping. Yeah. It's only when I tell them, your daddy and mommy don't sleep. Like oh, my parents are up all night long. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, good. Now, where are you going?